For the last six weeks, we've been walking through the covers, between the covers of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And I hope that as we've been between the covers, it's pressed you to get into God's Word more. Because as we get into God's Word, a beautiful thing happens, God's Word gets into us. And when when God's Word gets into us, it changes us. It not only changes our beliefs, but it changes our behavior. It transforms us. God's Word that's living, that's active, that's sharper than any two-edged sword. So over these last six weeks, today being the seventh week, we've covered 58 books of the Bible. Some 35 different authors. Now, some of our students, you know, you guys have book reports you have to do. I've, I've been given a book report for this will be seven weeks now. And I hope that as we've dove into the Word, that not only are there some things that maybe have, have reminded you of things, maybe some new things you've learned, but I hope that more than just information, I hope there's been a draw, an attraction to God's Word. I hope that you found yourself in some moments thinking, you know what, I'm going to just leave the TV off and I'm going to actually open up and, and read the Bible. I'm going to read in Philemon. I'm going to read in Nahum. I'm, I'm going to read some of these things that, that maybe I've always just kind of skipped over in my life. I, I'm going to read it knowing that everything in here has a purpose. There's no filler. There's nothing here just for fluff. That everything in God's Word is practical and useful and life-changing. And so today we come to the final eight books we'll look at. These eight books of the New Testament are referred to as general letters. General letters. Now, here's what that means. When we talk about these eight books being general letters, it means that they're just kind of written to an open audience. They're not written to a specific person, most of them. There's a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, they're not written to a specific person. They're not written even to a specific place. So they're known as the general letters. And these, it's interesting because these books of the New Testament make up around, actually a little bit less than 10% of the New Testament are these eight books. So the bulk of the New Testament, as we looked at last week, are Paul's letters. But these eight books make up just under 10% of the New Testament. But here's what's interesting. Even though they don't make up a lot of the New Testament, the weight they carry is much more than just the length of what they are or even the amount or the percentage that they have. It's kind of like the minor prophets. Remember when we talked about the minor prophets, we said, well, really that word minor refers to the fact that they're shorter, not the fact that they're not important. Well, these general letters, it's not kind of like, well, that's just some general information, whatever. It, th- okay, sometimes, you know what happens when you buy something, you get a, you know, if you, even if you buy a little $20 heater for, the, for, for your bedroom, you, you, there's a instructions inside there. And most of us, we pull those out and throw them aside, right? Well, these books, we don't need to just throw aside. These eight books matter. There's practical information, there's, there's theological truth, there's, there's transformational things in these books. So we're going to unpack these. And, and kind of what happens is these five authors... James, Peter, John, Jude, and the author of Hebrews, these five writers do something that's somewhat similar to what the gospel writers do. If you remember when we talked about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we talked about how those gospels all kind of had the same storyline. They were about the ministry and the life of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus, but they all came at that from a different perspective. And so even though they're telling the same story, they read a little bit different and they highlight different things. Well, when we come to these eight books... The fact is they all are helping us better understand what faith in Christ looks like. They're helping us better know what is it that we do now that we've trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How do we live? What does this look like in everyday life? And so even though there's eight different books, five different authors, the fact is they all have this common thread of helping us to find the practical side of our faith, the, the kind of where the rubber meets the road, if you will, part of our faith. And it's interesting because as we, as we unpack these, these letters, again, are written generally. They're written to, to kind of a, a wide scope of people and a wide scope of places. So, so in other words, they're, they're kind of for all of us. They really are. They're, they're for everyone who knows Christ as Lord and Savior. And even those who don't, who are checking out Jesus and trying to figure out, you know, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to trust Jesus. I mean, I, I, I've studied some other religions. I, I've read some other religious books. And so, so these books really help us to understand the uniqueness of Christ to understand the relationship of him to his church and us to the church and help us understand what it is that every day looks like when we follow Jesus like we should. So we're going to walk through and, and kind of unpack these and hit some highlights. Again, I want to remind you, we, we can't cover everything that's in them. 
We're doing this from kind of kind of like being on top of Curry Mountain and looking out, you know, across, and you kind of, oh yeah, I, I think that's such and such's house, or hey, I can see the high school, or or I see the interstate, or I see this, or I see that. Well, that's what we're doing. We're kind of hitting these books from a from a high point of view, just kind of looking down, kind of grabbing some things on them again, so that hopefully you'll want to go home and maybe even this week, if you've got some downtime, to pick up God's Word and to read it. So I want to begin with the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is the first of the, the general letters that we'll look at. Hebrews is interesting because there's no opening. If you go back and, and, and look at the other books of the New Testament, they have an opening. Even the Gospels, for the most part, have an opening. These, these other Paul's letters have an opening, a greeting. But Hebrews doesn't. It just kind of starts. Hebrews doesn't really give us who the author is. The other books tell us who wrote them. Hebrews doesn't tell us that. Now, scholars, some have said it's perhaps the Apostle Paul that wrote Hebrews. Some have suggested Luke. Other scholars have said perhaps Barnabas or maybe someone else wrote the book of Hebrews. So, so it's very interesting that here's this book that's found its way into God's word that has some very powerful truth that, that's transformational to our lives, and yet we don't even know who wrote it. And that, that's kind of bothered some people through church history. But, you know, honestly, when I step back and look at it, I'm kind of like, you know, that, that's, that's probably kind of a cool thing. Because we need to be reminded the power of God's word and the power of the gospel and the power of what God wants to do in our life and through our life is never us anyway. It doesn't need our name. It doesn't need our identity to matter. So Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. We don't know, uh, you know exactly. Uh, there's no hint given of it in, in the writing itself. But here's what we do know. We know who it was written to. Hebrews was written to Christians who had been Jewish. So they were, they were Jews who accepted Jesus as Messiah. So as Hebrews unpacks, as we read through it, what you discover is these recipients are Jewish believing, they're, they're Jesus believing Jews. That's who it's written to. Now, what's happened though is that as, as time has progressed, as a little bit of time has gone, this is early in church history, that what happens is that some of those are saying, well, you know, we believe Jesus, but, but maybe, may, maybe there's something more. Maybe there's more God has for us. And some of them maybe we're battling with, and it seems like that you see this in some of the other New Testament writings. There were some who said, okay, we accept Jesus as Messiah, but we want to keep some of this old law too. We want to keep some of our Judaism. We want to keep some of our heritage, if you will. And so there were those who said, yeah, we, we got to have kind of both. We gotta. So they were leaning into this, and the writer of Hebrews is challenging them to keep their commitment to Jesus strong, to keep their commitment to Jesus as primary as first. Not to say, well, here we have our, our Jewish heritage and our, our Jewish culture and traditions, and, and we're going to just kind of put Jesus in here. And that Jesus is kind of added and kind of like put him in the crock pot with everything else, it'll all be fine. No, the writer of Hebrews helps us understand you can't take Jesus and just add him to whatever else you believe, whether it's as a Jew or whether it's another kind of world religion or your own made up stuff. He says, no, Jesus is distinct. Jesus is unique. As a matter of fact, I want you to jot this down because Hebrews really does this uniquely. Hebrews emphasizes, you ready for this? Hebrews emphasizes Jesus as God's best. That's really what Hebrews is all about. Is the writer of Hebrews is saying, you know, you got to understand, Jesus isn't just good. Jesus isn't even just God's greatness toward us. Jesus is God's best. That Jesus is the best God has to give, he gave in Jesus the relationship we have, the truth that we have, the, the model, the example of life that we have, that Jesus is absolutely God's best, that Jesus completes what God started in the Old Testament. If you remember when we walked through the Old Testament, we talked about how all those different pieces of the Old Testament all pointed to something in the future, actually to someone in the future, and that's Jesus. And so Jesus doesn't come to erase and to throw away the old covenant. Jesus comes to complete it and to bring a new covenant. And that Jesus, what he brings, is not just a completion, it's better than the old. Now, some get uncomfortable with that, but that's exactly what Hebrews is all about. Is that Jesus is God's best. That the new covenant that Jesus brings is absolutely better than the old covenant. As a matter of fact, this is interesting. The word better shows up some ten times in the book of Hebrews, where the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, you know what, the old covenant was great, this is better. The old way, yeah, I know that was special, and I know it was, but this is even better. So the writer of Hebrews is helping us understand that Jesus is God's best. Let me give you a couple of verses you can jot down. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 22, it says, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is God's guarantee 
of a better covenant. Not just a completed covenant, not just a different covenant, not an equal covenant, a better covenant, a better relationship, a better way, a better process. Why? Because all of the Old Testament points to Jesus. And the New Testament helps us understand that Jesus is God's best, that God didn't hold anything back. He didn't say, well, I'm going to give you most of my best. I'm going to give you the majority of my best, but I'm going to hold something back and give you a little bit of something. He gave us all he had to give. He gave in Jesus. His absolute best he gave in Jesus. And then we come to Hebrews chapter number 8, and here's what he says in verse 6. He says, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. It's founded on even better promises. So the writer of Hebrews is helping these Jews who have believed in Jesus, but maybe who are struggling, who are not standing firm on their faith, who are saying, well, you know, it's good, but we still have the old, and the old is good. And matter of fact, the old is great. Matter of fact, there's some things we like better in the old than we like in the new. And he says, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus not only brings a new covenant and a new promise and a new relationship, but even better promise, an even better covenant, an even better relationship. Jesus is God's best. Now listen to me, church. The writer of Hebrews might as well have written this today because we live in a culture that wants to say, hey, if y'all want to believe in Jesus, that's great, but we're going to believe in Buddha or we're going to believe in Muhammad or we're going to believe in our own stuff or we're going to believe in science. And it's all equal and we all throw it in. And if there is a God, he's okay that we just kind of make a crockpot stew of religion and of faith. And as long as we're sincere, it's all fine. Well, can I help you with that? There's a Greek word for that and it's wrong, eh, wrong. There's a Greek word that says baloney. <laughs> That's just not true. That Jesus is God's best. There's not something else that God's going to give us later that's better than Jesus. There's not a better way. There's not a better place. There's not a better plan. That Jesus is God's absolute best that he gives us. In church this morning, we need to know that we live in a time that wants to say Jesus is good, but there's something better. Or Jesus may be better, and there's something equally is better, equally is good, equally is great. And the reality is there's not. All the other religions of the world are empty promises. There is no better promise in them. There is no promise in them. There is no hope in them. There is no life in them. The writer of Hebrews wants us to hold firm and stand firm. And here's what's interesting. Jesus, as God's best, changes some things. It's not only what we believe, but it's even how we behave. Because the writer of Hebrews then talks in chapter 10 about how we're not to forsake the coming together of ourselves as some are in the habit of doing. In other words, because Jesus is God's best in my personal life, Jesus is God's best in my personal life makes me want to be with other believers who have accepted God's best and that together we serve and we honor and we extend God's best. We expand God's kingdom. We push back the darkness together. You see it? So when someone says, well, I believe Jesus is God's best, but I'm going to take Jesus over here, and he's just going to be mine, and me and Jesus are going to have some time, and I don't need the church, and I don't need small groups, and I don't need other people in my life, and I don't need to share prayer requests. It's just me and God one-on-one. Well, then you're, you're, you're discounting. You're, you're disrupting God's best. Because Jesus as God's best calls us into relationship not only with him but with one another. And the writer of Hebrews emphasizes that it's not a solo thing. It's a solo commitment to Christ. But once we make that commitment, we're part of the family of God. We're part of the church. And Jesus is the head of that church. And he's not just a good idea. He's God's best idea. He's not just the son of God that God gave, and then later God's going to give some other way or some new way or some better way or some deeper thing or some higher thing. That Jesus is it. And he's it in the best way possible because he is God's best. So Hebrews emphasizes Jesus is God's best. Then we come to the book of James. Hebrews, James. The, the book of James is interesting. James was the brother of Jesus. But James didn't really become, we don't, we don't see James and we don't see his faith become personal. We, we don't see him leading in the church. He became a leader in the Jerusalem church. But it was after the resurrection. It's kind of like this. I, I think James may be one of those brothers that was like, you know, trying to sort this whole thing out. He's like, okay, let me get this right. So, so, so what you guys are telling me, and, and Jesus, what you're saying, is you're like God in the flesh? Like, like you, my punk brother, that, that, that sometimes got him on, you're, you're God in the flesh? I, I don't know about all that. Well, after Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again, guess what? He knew all about that. He's like, yep, 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 missed that one. 
And so James becomes a follower of Jesus, and James becomes recognized as a leader in the Jerusalem church. And here's what James is known for. He's known for his wisdom, and he's known for his advice, his practical advice. So James is very interesting in his writing. He kind of uses those two perspectives and those two things. That James, as he writes, helps us to understand the significance of the resurrection and the fact that it changes us. And James is kind of an interesting guy because he takes two extremes and and kind of brings them together. You know, some of us, we know people who are like, ready, aim. Ready, aim. Ready, aim. Ready, aim. All they ever do is aim. They don't do anything. And then we know other people who are like, fire. Did I hit anything? Fire. I I, I didn't even aim. (laughs) Can you believe it? It just worked out. There's two extremes, right? Well, James is ready, aim, fire. In other words, here's how I want you to jot it down. James focuses on two things, practical wisdom and personal work. Practical wisdom, ready, aim, all right? What am I going to do? How am I going to respond? Fire. What am I going to do? So in other words, again, all of these eight general books, these general letters, help us understand the fact that when we know Christ as Lord and Savior, it's not just that our beliefs change, our behavior changes. It's not just about information, it's about transformation that leads us to action. And James really does an incredible job of unpacking this for us. And and the fact that he gives advice about practical wisdom and he shows us what what it looks like to have personal work. So let me give you some examples of this. James encourages us as believers with everyday realities. In other words, what James does is he takes the reality of following Christ and Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and then I give my life to Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within me, and and now I'm Christ's hands and feet. And it goes from this idea, it goes from this thing we talk about at church to, okay, so now what? James is an action guy. So, okay, yeah, yeah, I got it. So now what? So what am I supposed to do? So, so, so now what? Well, he answers this. Let me just give you a couple of examples. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he talks about trials as opportunities for spiritual growth. James says, listen, when, when trials come, don't, don't be like, oh, no, what am I going to do? This is so bad. He said, look at the bad. Said, hey, you know what? It's an opportunity for me to show my faith is in God, not my circumstances. This is an opportunity for me to remind myself and to show others that my confidence is not in me and in what I know and what I can do. It's in the Lord and who he is and what he can do. In that same chapter, chapter number one, down toward the end, verse 27 of James 1, he talks about helping the needy. So in other words, James says, you know, it's one thing to have a faith in your heart and a faith in your head, but what does it do? It should affect our hands. Are we helping those who are less fortunate? Are we showing the grace of God, the mercy of God? James chapter two, verse one, avoid favorites. Some of us have been in churches where they need to read that text and practice that, where where there were favorites. And it was obvious who the favorites were. James says, you know what? That's not only a bad idea, that's a destructive idea. When the body of Christ begins to have favorites, whether because of influence or because of money or because of of, of friendship, that that there are favorites and and that those favorites can get in the way of, of God's favor, of what God wants to do, of God's purposes in and through us and in and through our lives. Chapter three, some of us are familiar with he deals with the tongue. Very practical wisdom about the tongue. He says, listen, you know what? That, that, that little thing in your mouth, those words that you speak, James knew better. James never would have believed the little nursery rhyme that says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names can never hurt me. James would have said, you've lost your mind. Names hurt. Bad statements, negative things toward us. We remember those more than we remember the good stuff that's said. So he talks about the power of the tongue. And he talks about how the tongue can, can start a wildfire. We can see that on the news right now, how these fires just engulf, I mean, homes that are just nothing left, forests where there's nothing, roads where the, where the asphalt has melted and it's almost this, these, this fire. He says, that's what happens, the tongue, just that little word. Well, I'm just going to speak my mind. I just say what comes to mind. Do us all a favor. Do yourself a favor. Don't do that. That's not good. Well, they know how I am. They know how to tell you. No. James says we're the guard it. We're to control it. Control the tongue. And then chapter 5, he talks about praying for each other. Very practical wisdom. The kind of so what? All right, so now what? But James not only deals with this practical wisdom, he also talks about personal work. Now understand, James does not discount what Paul says about salvation through faith alone. We talked about that last week. That salvation is not of what we do. We don't do enough where God goes, oh man, tell you what, that's pretty good right there. I think I'll put you on my team. Now, listen, God did for us what we could never do for ourselves to give us what we don't deserve, his grace and his mercy. 
But James takes a step further and says, and when we've received that mercy, and when we've received that grace, and when we've been redeemed, and when we've been born again, guess what? We're not going to want to say, well, I'm just going to sit this one out. We're not going to want to say, well, hey, I, I'm just tapping out. I'll, I'll just be, I'm just going to be right over here. I, I don't want to mess anything. That because of Christ in us, we will have the passion of Christ. And Jesus said he came to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus is the one who went to the woman at the well. Jesus is the one who stepped in when the woman was about to be stoned to death, who was caught in adultery. Jesus is the one who said to the fishermen, follow me, and I'll make you fishermen. Jesus is the one who went to Matthew, the tax collector, and said, get out of there. Quit collecting taxes. Let's go give away grace. And so it makes sense that James would say, hey, this practical wisdom connects back with our personal work, with what we do. Matter of fact, James chapter 2, listen to what it says, verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and without daily food, and someone says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Isn't that interesting? So James is saying, show me your heart of faith and I'll show you your hands that are in action. He says, the fact is, anyone who says, I know Christ and Jesus has changed my life and I'm a follower of Christ and the resurrected power of Jesus is in me, but I can just kind of sit out and be in the shadows and, and, and I'm not worried about anybody else and I'm not sharing the gospel with anybody and I'm not worried about those who are poor and I'm not worried about those who are spiritually poor and I'm not worried about those who are being cast aside and I'm not worried about those who are being, that I'm just all, I'm, I'm fine with it all. James says, I'm not sure you know the Jesus I know because the Jesus I know changes not only, again, not only my beliefs, but my behavior. That Jesus affects not only my heart, but my hands, the effects, not only the, the, the confidence in my spirit, but he even will get into my checkbook and how I spend my resources and, and how I use my time when Jesus comes into our life. See, James, practical wisdom, personal work. See, sometimes we struggle with this whole idea of, of works and we, we, get, we go too far one way or the other. We either act like, well, we got to do all this to help God out and impress God, or we go the other way. So well, I don't have to do anything. You may not have to do anything, but you want to. You want to serve the Lord. You want to be part of lives being changed. You want to be in on, on, on the God stuff that's happening. You can't help but sometimes talk to someone, and even when, even when you think, I probably shouldn't talk to them. I probably should just stay out of this. I, said, I can't. Just like Jesus couldn't stay in heaven and say, you know what? They've messed it up. Oh, well, hate it for you guys. He left heaven. He emptied himself of his glory, Philippians 2 says. So Hebrews, Jesus is God's best. James helps us to see practical wisdom and personal work. Then we come to First and Second Peter. Now, Peter was one of the 12 disciples. Peter was writing to persecuted churches in what's today Turkey. Chris knows where that is, been there. Not Turkey like we're about to eat in a couple of days, but the country Turkey. Do they even have turkeys in Turkey? I've always, okay, they do. All right, just wondering. All right, so is that where they came from? Can you come up here and answer questions for me because I'm confused. No, I'm just kidding. So written to churches who are persecuted in what's today Turkey, it was delivered, his first letter, 1 Peter, was delivered by Silas, who was a partner in ministry with Paul. Now, here's the interesting thing. If anybody can relate to the subject he's writing about, it's Peter. Remember, Peter's the one who, on the one hand, was always bold, always, I was like, hey, Jesus, man, where do we go? Man, hey, hey, listen, anybody comes after you, I'm taking them down. All these, other, all these other knuckleheads may deny you, I'll never deny you. But then the little servant girl says, hey, weren't you with, I wasn't with Jesus. Get out of here, leave me alone. He denied Jesus three times. Peter knew what it went from being the guy that was like, man, all these people, what's, come on, people need to get serious. They need to get on with this. Wait. To being the guy who was coward and ashamed and to then being the one who was restored by Jesus. And Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, you know what I want you to do because you love me? Feed my sheep. And even though Peter didn't feel worthy to do that, God called him, Jesus called him to feed his sheep. But Peter knew what it was like to suffer. So first and second Peter really deal with this issue of suffering, of suffering. First and second Peter encourage us as believers in our suffering. Now again, think about it. Peter's writing this. He suffered when he denied Jesus, and that was his own choice. But Peter also knew what it was like to suffer because he preached Jesus. 
So in other words, the kind of suffering that Peter addresses in 1st and 2nd Peter is two kinds of suffering. One is suffering from without, circumstances, people, situations, others. And then the second is suffering from within. The difficulties we bring to our own self, how we let our doubts start to drive our life. And how we let our fear overcome our faith. So let me give you a couple of examples here. 1st and 2nd Peter, in 1st Peter chapter 4 talking about suffering from without. Here's what he says. He says, dear friends, beginning in verse number 12, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering. Listen to what he says. As though something strange were happening to you. See, it was happening then like it does now. Well, I can't believe, man, I went to church and I, I even sang some of them songs and I even put money in the offering plate. And next thing I know, man, I'm in trouble at work this week or my friend won't talk to me or, or I've got the, the report from the doctor. That's t- I can't believe. Peter says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you stand up for Jesus at school and people make fun of you. Don't be surprised when at work you speak truth and your boss says, you know what, listen, you need to keep your religion at home. Don't be bringing that here. Don't be surprised when you live in a culture that says, you know what, listen, we know what the Bible says about marriage, but we're going to redefine it. I mean, we need to be more open-minded. We, need, we, need, we just need to, don't be surprised, he says, as though something strange were happening to you, verse 13, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his Glory is revealed. Isn't that interesting? He says, in other words, when we deal with the suffering, the people making fun of us, people saying we're narrow-minded, people saying, man, y'all are, y'all are acting like there's only one way. Well, it, there is. We didn't make that up. Jesus said that. God's word says that. And the fact is, he says, don't be surprised by that. He said, because when you share in those sufferings, you can look forward to the glory when it's revealed. So in other words, when Jesus comes again and every knee bows and every tongue confesses, remember, that's what we learned, that revelation is all about encouragement. We know how, we, we know how the story ends. We know how the game ends. We win. And even though we may be down, and even though it may look like, man, they're running all over us, and it may look like they've read our playbook, and it may look like the enemy and the culture that somehow Christianity is dead, and it's over, and it's done. Just remember, Jesus, it looked like he was dead, and over, and done, but he rose again. And so here's what we see. Peter says, in that suffering, all those circumstances, he said, "There's there's there's a greater joy that we have. And all of that, we shouldn't be surprised by it. The fact is, if we never suffer, someone as well said, if you never have conflict with the world, then that means you and the world are going the same direction. That when we live against the culture, and we go across the grain, but there's also a suffering not only from without, but Peter also addresses in 2 Peter a suffering that comes from within. Listen to what he says in verse number 17 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, so he says, all right, you know this, But be on your guard so that you will not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. See, in 2 Peter, 1 Peter, he's talking about this suffering from without, what people do to us, what people say to us, the culture that we live in, the times, all those kind of things. Then 2 Peter, he says, but there's another kind of suffering, and it comes from within us. It's our own doubts that say, well, do 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 you really think God wants to use you? What if you take a stand for God and what if things don't go good? What if you lose your job? What if somebody makes fun of you at school? What if your friends won't talk to you? What if all these self-doubts, sometimes it's our emotions. Sometimes our own emotions have us on a roller coaster. So no one, listen, if we were on a deserted island by ourselves, there are some of us, and most of us, if we were to be honest, we're going to struggle with us sometimes, with our thoughts, with our doubts, with our attitudes, with our past that the enemy brings up constantly. Don't you think that Peter knew what it's like to have the enemy say, Peter, who are you to be telling the church what to do? Who are you to be talking about facing the, 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 the having power and having strength and suffering? Who are you to do that when you denied Jesus and, and when you denied him not only once, not only twice, but three? Who are you? We see it. Same thing happens to us, doesn't it? We find ourselves doubting. We find ourselves uncertain. We find ourselves doubting what we know. He says there, you know this, but be on your guard. Church, can I tell you, we know what God's word says on the big things. But yet, if we're not careful, if we don't guard them, they get away from us. We know what God's word says about salvation. It's found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus. We know that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We know the Bible says there's only one kind of marriage, and it wasn't the government's idea or the church idea. It was God's idea. It's a marriage between a man and a woman for life. But yet, 
we can easily step back and start saying, well, yeah, but I don't know. Things have changed and times have changed and people have changed. And you're right. But yet at the same time, in all of that doubt, we've got to hold to what we know. Let it be an anchor to our soul. Listen to what he says, so that we will not fall from our secure position. Now, here's what's interesting. In 2 Peter, the suffering is connected to another thing. Not only is it from without and within, but there's this within and without that happen at the same time to do with the return of Christ. Because see, in Peter's days, he's coming, he, 2 Peter, he's toward the end of his life. He's, written, he's, write, he's writing from a Roman prison cell. He knows that he's about to die. And he knows his question is what the question of the church has been and what Paul addresses in Thessalonians even, where the whole issue is, I thought Jesus was coming again. Where is he at? I mean, things have gotten bad. Why hasn't Jesus come? Things have gotten even worse. Why hasn't Jesus come? Does God not know what's going on around here? <laughs> it's time for Jesus to come. I mean, I'm looking at the prophecies. They're being fulfilled. I'm looking at this. And this person, listen, we've gone, listen, from the time even of the early church, they expected in their lifetime Jesus to come. And you know what? That's our blessed hope. But here's what Peter does. Peter does something very interesting. He answers the question, why does God delay? Why didn't, when the church started facing persecution in the book of Acts, why didn't Jesus come? When, when, when the church had been planted all over the world and people have heard and, 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 and things were getting worse and, and, and Christians were being worse, why didn't Jesus come? Around the world today, in the 1960s, people thought Jesus was coming. Y2K, Jesus is coming. 2003, Jesus is coming. Why in our life, why does God delay? Doesn't he know how bad things are? Why doesn't Jesus come? And Peter answers that. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. His some count slowness. He goes on to say, but rather he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So in other words, this suffering from without, this suffering from within and even tied back to this false teaching that was going on in Peter's day where there were those who were saying, hey, look, you know, Jesus died, but was buried and rose again. You say, but you say he's coming again. He ain't done it yet. So can we really trust his death, burial, and resurrection? He hasn't come yet. He didn't come in the first generation. He hasn't come in the second generation. It's gener thousands of years. Why hasn't he come? The answer is this. God's delay is because of grace. God's delay is because of mercy. So the next time you're sharing with someone and they say, well, you know, I tell you what, I'm, I'm just having a Why hasn't Jesus come? Well, buddy, can I be real honest with you? It's because of this conversation we're having right now. That God doesn't want to come now because if he comes, you'll be forever separated from him. Why doesn't Jesus? It's an expression of grace and of mercy, do you see it? And Peter knew the church was suffering from within and from without. There are those outside the church. Oh, well, y'all are teaching Jesus. Well, Jesus hadn't come. I don't believe it. See, where's he at? And then inside their own hearts, they're going, yeah, why hasn't he come? Things are bad. Man, we got sickness and we got death and we've got persecution and we've got false teaching. And all. why doesn't Jesus come? We may feel that way today. And church, let me remind us, it's that every day that Jesus doesn't come is a day that he's giving us to witness for him. It's a day he's giving us to share the gospel with men, women, boys and girls. He's giving us a delay of his grace, a delay through his grace so that people can respond to his grace so there can be a delay of his judgment, which is the most gracious thing he could ever do. And Peter addresses this. Peter helping us understand how to be encouraged in suffering both without and within. James helping us know wisdom for everyday life and personal work. Hebrews, Jesus is God's best. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are interesting. They're all written by John. Uh, they're they're, they're kind of to the point. It's like, you know, John had, is, is not being flowery. He's, not, he's just like, okay, boom, here, 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 here's the deal. First, second, third John addressed the heresy. Here, here's the common theme through all of those. They addressed the heresy that Jesus was only spirit and not man. That same heresy we can hear today. And it goes one or two ways. Either people say, well, Jesus wasn't God. He was just man. He was a good teacher. He had some good things to say. We should learn about him. We should listen to him. You know, we should love like him. That's all. But he's not God. Or it goes the other extreme. Well, he was God, but he couldn't have been man because if he was God, why would he be sinful man? And he wasn't really a man. And he may look like he died on the cross, but he didn't really die. He wasn't really born of a virgin because he wasn't really born because he's like just spirit. He just looked like a man. And, and all, it's just chaos is what it creates. And John was dealing with this even then. 
And John knew that in our finite mind, we want to understand. And he knew that to understand that Jesus was completely man and completely God is hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's hard for us to understand. And so here's what he does. He makes it very clear how to know if a spirit is of the Lord, how to know truth and how truth is highlighted, exclamationed and circled by God. Here's 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is from God is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So what's the spirit of the Antichrist? Those who say Jesus is not God. He said, you've heard this is coming, and even now it's already in the world. Isn't that interesting? That thousands of years ago, John says the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. He didn't show up with Russia. He didn't show up with Obama. He didn't show up with Trump. He He already was here. The spirit of the Antichrist. What is that? Denying that Jesus is God. You see it? Listen to this. 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching that both the Father and the Son have the Father and the Son. There are those who want to separate God the Father and God the Son, yet they're one. Then 3 John chapter 1, verse number 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So John said, it matters. Walking in the truth matters. That Jesus is all that Scripture says he is. He is God. He is man. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Holy One. He's the only one he could do for us what he did. He's the only one that gives salvation. He's the only one that gives mercy. He's the only one that gives forgiveness. He's the only one that gives life. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. He's the only one under heaven by which we must be saved. Only Jesus. Because he's God's best. Remember, we've already saw that in Hebrews. And when we understand God's best, we want God's best for others. James shows us that. And then first and second, Peter, that when we talk about the best, some say, oh, you can't say best. Everybody gets a trophy. Every religion's okay as long as you're sincere and you help people and do the best you can. God understands. No, he doesn't. God understands. He gave his son, his one and only son, that he is the only way, and it's a narrow way, but that whoever calls on his name will be saved. Wow. And then finally, we come to Jude, a little small book right before Revelation. Jude was another brother of Jesus. I don't know if you knew that. James was a brother of Jesus who wrote James, and Jude was a brother of Jesus. And Jude challenges believers, and I want you to jot this down. Jude challenges believers to demonstrate God's love, to show compassion, and to rescue sinners. Jude talks about fighting for the faith, and, 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 and Jude talks about standing. And, and again, he, he recognizes this not only as a brother physically, but as a spiritual brother. But then he says, all right, so now what? And it really makes sense that Jude is right before Revelation because remember, Revelation is we know how the story ends. We know that we win. And Jude says, so how should we live if we know that we win? But like Peter said, sometimes we're down. Sometimes the scoreboard doesn't reflect what's going to happen at the end. Sometimes it looks like our plays are not working. Sometimes it looks like our coach is missing it. Sometimes it looks like we're not making the plays. So what do we do? Jude says, this is what we're to do. We're to demonstrate God's love. We're to show compassion, and we're to rescue sinners. And those last two words, I think, are so vital, rescue sinners. See, our call as believers in Jesus Christ, our mission as a church is not just to make people's life better, is not just to be kind, is not just to help people less fortunate, is not just to make a difference in our community and and bring everybody, you know, our, listen, our primary goal is to rescue sinners. Rescue, what does that mean? That means our life is at risk. When someone goes in as a hero and and goes in to to, to make a rescue and becomes a hero, their life is at risk. They don't rescue from a distance. They go into the fire. They go into the water. They go into the house. They go into the crisis situation. They go into the hostage negotiator. They, They go in. And church, listen, if we're not going in, then we can't rescue sinners. If we're staying at church, you go, well, I hope they come. Let's put some more ads on TV. Let's get some newspaper ads. Let's get a billboard. Let's let's get them in here. No, we've got to go to where they are. Rescue means going to where the danger is, going to where the fire is, going to where the drowning is, going to where the darkness is, going to where the lostness and hopelessness is. Rescue sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're not trying to find good people and make them better. we got to understand all of us are lost and in desperate need of a Savior. And that only when we understand our lostness can we understand God's forgiveness. And only when we understand our separation can we understand the salvation. You see it? 
So let me just close by reading Jude chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He says, be merciful to those who doubt. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, say to the doubters, come on, get over it. What's wrong with you? You ought to know better than that, man. See, you should have showed up to Sunday school more. You wouldn't doubt. So, no, he says, be merciful. Be merciful to those who doubt. Verse 23, save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In other words, again, Jude, challenging us to demonstrate God's love, to show compassion, and to rescue sinners. So as we come to the end of this series, and we've been between the covers, here's the question. Is the truth found between the covers? Is the Jesus found between the covers? Is this truth and this Jesus in your heart? See, some of us are going to miss heaven by about 18 inches, the distance from our head to our heart. There's some things we know, but we don't believe. There are some things we've read, and we maybe kind of understand, but we've not acted on. You see, God didn't give us his word just for information. He gave it for transformation, for salvation, to reveal himself to us and reveal ourself to ourself so that we will know our desperate need for him. So I ask you this morning, if you've never trusted Christ, why not today let this be your day of salvation? Why not today let the Spirit of God do the greatest rescue ever and rescue you from yourself, from your sin, from your separation from God? That whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And today, that can be you. There's some here, we know Christ is Lord and Savior, but we've not been between the covers. Man, we, we, we've not read God's word, and, and I hope that God has sparked a new desire in us. A new attraction, a new drawing, a new hunger and thirst for his word. Hebrews is where it also says God's word's living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. That cuts to the core of who we are. And why? So that it can bring healing and hope. When a surgeon cuts open someone and goes into their, to their heart or goes into the, another organ, he doesn't go there to bring death, he goes there to try to bring life. And that's what God's word does. It cuts in so it can bring life and bring hope to us. There are some of us, we know Christ is Lord and Savior, but we've never been baptized by immersion. Jesus was baptized. All Gospels make that clear. The book of Acts shows that, that baptism is the outward expression of being a follower of Jesus. It's the wedding ring. It's the uniform of a Jesus follower. There are some of us, we need to get connected to the church. Maybe you're here, but you're not connected here. Maybe you're not in a small group. Maybe you're not consistent. Maybe you're not a member, and you need to connect and be, be all in with what God's doing, not because of us, but because of who he is.